fault. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome in another glitch, which is fitting for a glitch in the matrix. I tell you what, every intro I do, there's something a little glitchy going on. I am so glad you guys are here today. I have a fantastic show set up for us. I have Fred Roll. Fred in Alaska is here in the studio with us today. We're going to be talking about subarctic Alaska Sasquatches and much more. If you guys would like to follow along with what I do with all my shows and uh, with all the events I'm going to be speaking at, conferences I'll be at, things like that, you guys go to thecryptidhunteress.com. You can find all of my uh, shows there and everything I'm up to. I try to put some podcasts that I'm on, y'all. I'm on a lot of podcasts these days. <laughs> uh, but go to my website. That's where you'll find all the information you need about me. Okay, and also, if you'd like to support what I'm doing, I have a Patreon. That's the Cryptid Huntress over on Patreon. Shout out to all my Patreon members. I love you guys. Uh, thank you so much. That that Patreon really correlates to my um, Thursday night shows with the remote viewing data. And uh, yeah, it's a great way to support what I'm doing. Um, thank you all so much for your support there. Also, I have a shop that's called War Woman Goods. That's on Etsy. Uh, and uh, I sell vintage Native American turquoise jewelry for the most part over there uh, with some other stuff. So uh, that's a great way to support the Cryptid Huntress as well. So thank you guys so much for everything. Um, it, it means the world to me that you guys support me so much. Um, okay. Well, without further ado, I have Fred here. He's in Alaska. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and introduce Fred, and we're going to get this party started. Okay. Fred Roll is a First Nations Alaska Native and Kuryong Tribal Council member from Dillingham, Alaska. While he doesn't consider himself a researcher, he's dedicated to documenting the oral history of the Bristol Bay watershed and the state of Alaska as a whole. His YouTube channel, Subarctic Alaskan Sasquatch, is a platform for reporting and recording Alaskan hairy man encounters. It's a source for Alaskans to get information about areas they might go hunting, fishing, and camping in. And even if the information is not accepted by everybody, if it helps one person, it's successful. With up to 2,000 people going missing each year in Alaska, he recognizes that not all are Sasquatch related. However, if there's even one, y'all, it's way too many. Okay, so please help me welcome to A Glitch in the Matrix today, my friend, Fred Roll. Hey, hey good Fred. morning, Jessica. How's it going? Hey, it's going amazing. It's going great. It's so good to see you again and to have you here on my channel this time, The Cryptid Huntress. Right. It's yeah. kind of different not doing it live, but that's okay with me too. <laughs> yes. uh, scheduling scheduling has been a pain with the short season. Uh, some of the tree species up here are already turning yellow um, because of the seasons being so short. So, you know, getting out into the field is just detrimental if, you know, if you're going out looking at anything or any signs of anything. So it's been, oh, yeah. it's been rough this year. A lot of rain, not a whole lot of fun out there with all the mosquitoes and the high strangeness that happens and stuff in the field. It's, it's, it is what it is, you know. Okay, so you are a dedicated boots on the ground field researcher. Well, I mean, you said you're you're an experiencer, right? I mean, you're just out there experiencing yeah. stuff. Yeah, I'm just I'm just out there. I, I go to areas where people have had encounters, and I just look for uh, just what's going on in the area. Basically, um, we're out in Willow, north of Willow. Uh, I won't say exactly where because other people are actively uh, working in that area. But there's experiences that happen like between Hatcher's Pass, Archangel Valley, and then on the opposite, directly opposite of that on the north side over the mountain range is Willow. And we suspect there's a trackway of some kind going in through there, some kind of corridor that they're traveling through because uh, I'm, I'm getting information onto the map so we can kind of plot the direction and whatnot and... Uh, see what's going on over there there's a just a whole lot of stuff happening all sorts okay. of reports uh these things showing themselves during the daytime and Ooh. high strangeness high strangeness okay. i tell you 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 said my word okay so my phrase high strangeness now fred you have not really talked too much about the high strangeness in the woods you only have talked to me in the past about the sasquatch activity so that indicates yeah. to me that you might have had something more than just Sasquatch activity out in the woods. What have you been experiencing? Oh, well, 
like in the Copper River Valley, uh, we had a couple orbs show up. Uh, me and I, I call him Squatch Bait. He's the only one that really goes out in the woods with me. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, we were at this lady's house uh, checking on some activity because she had like a 18 inch track next to her house. Her house is getting banged on. Uh, you know, strange noises, owl hoots and a, a raven kind of sounding like they're arguing with each other. And that doesn't happen in the wild. So we were checking things out. And after we had looked around the property all day, just checking it out and stuff, we got back to her cabin and she noticed a light outside the window. And so I sat in her seat so I could see from her perspective. And there was this light kind of shimmer in there. So I, I couldn't tell if it was light refraction or not. So I got up, went out in the driveway and it was like a light creamsicle orange, kind of opaque. It wasn't like a bright light. It was just opaque. And when I went outside, it started shimmering and moving into the woods as I crossed the driveway to get a closer look at it. And I immediately got the feeling of it's trying to entice me into the woods. So I, I wasn't having any of that crap. I just went right back inside. But another red one showed up shortly after that. And they moved through the woods and, I mean, basically dissipated after a little bit. We stopped watching because she, she's 78. You know, she has some heart issues. And I, I didn't feel it was good for her health to continue getting freaked out, you know, with the orbs moving. So we just kind of shut the curtains and changed the subject for her sake. And then uh, just a few nights ago, we were out in Willow checking things out. Uh, we had found some juvenile tracks next to this musk egg and we we're kind of looking in the area. Uh, we ended up camping out there a few days uh, when we were camping out. It was raining most of the day, so it was kind of miserable getting camp set up and everything. But as soon as it started getting into darkness, this fog, real thick fog, just rolls in on us. And uh, as we were sitting there, it, it just eerie feeling came over us. And we, we're we grown men. We're not quick to be startled and all freaked out, you know, and that type of thing. It's just not us. But we started hearing this murmuring off in the distance and it sounded, it had kind of a woman's tone. We couldn't make out any, any noise. Uh, I mean, it, it was just a murmur just out of earshot but barely audible so we decided to hike the trail you know uh we went heavily armed of course and land of the midnight sun it was it was twilight i mean we could see the trail i mean it, it wasn't it wasn't like pitch black yet <laughs> so as we're going down the trail we got a ways we, we we're hearing flanking you know sounds off in the distance you know the branches snapping and stuff and <laughs> As we're going along, unbeknownst to me, uh, my buddy Ryan, he saw one of these orbs off to our left, just kind of behind us a little bit. And a moment or two later, uh, within 10 steps, I saw one in front of us off to our right a little bit. So, you know, if we were on a, a, a clock dial, we were facing towards like 10 o'clock on the trail and it would have been 6 and 12 that the lights, you know, uh, the orbs had flashed. And what was weird about these orbs is Everyone has flashlights and stuff, but they produce a beam. And in the fog, as you, I'm sure you well know, you turn on a flashlight beam in the fog and it lights up everything. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because of the, just the moisture in the air. So this was just a, a light, a white light um, on both sides. It, it only lasted for a few seconds and then it went away. Uh, the, the movement uh, just out of eye shot picked up a little bit. The murmuring. Anytime we stopped and we're kind of listening for any sounds around us, the murmuring would continue uh, just out of earshot, just kind of a, another lure it felt like. So we were picking up on the eeriness of being lured away from camp. But again, we were heavily armed. So we, you know, we're like, all right, if they're, you know, if they want something, they're going to get some kind of attitude about it. But as we were going along, we finally got to a point where it, it just, the, the murmuring started behind us and off in front of us. It, it was kind of like this just always out of earshot. And we had thermal, you know, we had a thermal scope, but mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone's aware. If there's a lot of moisture in the air, fog, humidity, whatever, it washes out like a red tomato that you can't pick up anything on them. So with that going on, we decide we'll just go back to camp. Um, the murmuring it got a little louder at one point, but it didn't, 
it, it still wasn't audible. Like we couldn't make out the words. It, it was just murmuring in the distance, which was, I mean, in the thick fog, it was dark. It, it was creepy as hell, to be honest with you. Uh, no one was necessarily scared. We just, I mean, you can't shoot an orb. It won't do you any good. You know what I mean? Well, so you can. We, we you just, have to go through it. Well, yeah, exactly. So we decided to, to head back to camp. Uh, it, it stayed relatively quiet once we're back at camp. But the, the oddest thing about that night is uh, a day later after we got back, uh, I just got a random call from someone I never heard before in my life. He, he just called up and says, hey, I've been following your channel. I don't know if you're aware of this area. And he literally lays out the same area we were at, which I found so coincidental. You know, he, he was calling to warn me and give me the heads up about this spooky, crazy area. And I, I happened to be there the same night he was. Wow. He was there with his wife and daughter. And as the fog rolled in, he had similar circumstances without the orbs, just the, the murmuring in the distance. And then he had three of these things circling his camp. Uh, he suspected, uh, you know, a male, a female, and a juvenile. And he found some juvenile tracks as well. So it, it, it kind of let us know. And he was within... Uh, less than two miles where we were and up here in alaska two miles is not that far at all uh, it's really not because it's so vast up here we're basically a couple of musk eggs away from each other but uh yeah so he had that happen and i i had to cut him off when he was telling me a story and kind of chuckle i was like we were there the same night dealing with some of the similar crap but uh yeah i mean it, it's it's different it's different dealing with the orbs because once I've seen orbs in the past, but it was at across a valley and they were doing moving, getting larger, smaller. And then, you know, they disappeared. And then this UFO type thing fucking came down and took off. And that was eons ago. That's the only, and there was no correlation between the, the orbs and any kind of hairy man activity. So I could never put the two together. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so with this, I mean, we're finding tracks, you know, uh, juvenile tracks and, these orbs happening and stuff and then the copper river thing similar thing you know found tracks we're seeing signs everywhere and then the orbs show up so it was kind of creepy and i have no clue what the orbs signify or what they do I, i've never really looked into it that much that's not really my my forte i just kind of like going out in the woods and you know looking around that kind of thing but yeah it was definitely creepy definitely yeah well, Fred, I got to tell you, uh, my team, and we're out in the field, we're doing research. One of the constants that we have out there are orbs. Uh, we have a lot of orbs all over the south, down here in the southeastern U.S. You know, you're, you're way up there in Alaska. I was just waiting for the day you're going to tell me about some orbs. I've been waiting for this. <laughs> 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 so yeah you know i gotta tell you one of the last times that i encountered orbs was not that long ago and uh and it was the the orb that i saw was orange like you described at that woman's house uh it was it was orange and it and it moved through the tree line and then right when the when i didn't see it move anymore there was a huff and a growl and i and i checked to make sure oh. there wasn't a, a, a bear out there there was no bear and it was a place where we have a lot of sasquatch activity um and so and then it immediately started pouring down raining and we had we had to jump in the vehicle and get out of there because it was raining so hard um came out of nowhere by the way but we have a lot of orbs now what what, what was your feeling okay because you remember seeing those orbs that had an et or a ufo connection back in the day did it feel like right. it could have been some people say orbs could be like Sasquatches or something. I mean, what, what, what do you think? I mean, I know it's right. baffling. Um, yeah. What, what they seem like in the time was like a lure, uh, a lure. like, you know, a little fuzzy feather on a, on a string, you know, luring a cat away or playing with the cat or whatever. It, it didn't, there was, there was movement, but it wasn't in the same places as the orb. So it, it felt more like a lure, kind of like it was luring us further away uh, along with the murmuring. That, that's the initial feeling we got. And, and I mean, our, our little excursion away from camp, honestly, it didn't last all that long. We maybe went uh, maybe a half a mile. And uh, it, it was, he saw, he saw it light up behind us for, for a few brief moments. And I saw one light up in front of us for a few brief moments 
but that was, I mean, there was no, there was no stick breaking or anything in those exact areas, but that again, it, that doesn't mean anything. It's all perspective. You know, we, we could have been, you know, not picking up on all the, you know, you got to understand when we're moving through the dense trees up here, um, I, I have some footage. It'll be on my next video of exactly what we were dealing with. And it is so the vegetation so dense. Um, the fact that we even saw the orbs in the woods, we were lucky because it, it was just, just at the right time um yeah honestly it it, it very well could have been but again it, it was just brief moments and there was other stuff happening at the same time with the murmuring and you know the the flanking noises we heard bipedal walking uh that the bipedal walking right after seeing the orbs that that was pretty creepy because it sounded like it was coming in on us. It was kind of like cut, cutting an angle to cut us off at the pass kind of thing. And again, we, we were heavily armed. So immediately, you know, everyone was on point, but with trying to use the, uh, the thermal, it, it just washed out. We couldn't make anything out. It was like, it, it was weird because as soon as all that activity died down back at camp and it got quiet, the fog lifted. The fog was just <laughs> gone. Right. And so that was real aggravating because once that happened, we could see perfectly with the thermal. You know what I mean? It was almost like yeah. we were lured away and all our technology was nullified due to the fog, you know? So it's it, oh it just weird. Just weird. And the energy in the air was just uh, oppressive, you know? Oh, I, I know exactly yeah, what you're talking about because I've actually experienced that before. And, uh, and okay, so first of all, you are surrounded in, from the front and the back with orbs, okay, uh -huh. lights. Then you had uh, something walking parallel to you guys surrounding you. You yeah. had fog. You had so, so this was just a night of total high strangeness. I've totally been there. And right. as a matter yeah. of fact, and the murmuring. And the murmuring, okay, so I've, I've heard that before, too. Now, there was one night when we were out up in uh, North Georgia, in the North Georgia mountains, and uh, my, my, one of my teammates and I had taken a group of people up there, um, away from our base camp where the rest of the group was, and uh, some, some friends of the head of our team were with us. They weren't part of our team. So we were having to kind of protect these people and keep an eye out, watch their six and everything, uh, and take them kind of to have a Bigfoot experience, basically. <laughs> and we got up to the top of the mountain, and this fog started, ch like, chasing us, basically. The fog was literally following us like it had a consciousness to it. And it felt uh -huh. like there was something in it, Fred. It was, it was actually scary. And I was with a, a retired Special Forces Army guy, okay, uh, and we were we were armed as well, but you you don't know what's in that fog. And, it, and it, every time we would move, it would it would move. We'd stop, it'd stop. We'd speed up, it'd speed up. And uh, it, it just felt right. like there was something in it, and it was very ominous, as though something was about to jump out of that fog and get us. So we had to hightail it out of there with those people um, because of that <laughs> fog. There's a uh, there's some uh, stories of the fog rolling in and little people involved, like uh, Vincent from Nunapichuk. I, I shared his uh, fog experience with the little people. That one's pretty creepy because this thing uh, looked like his friend in the fog. So he went in to see his friend and turned out to be this little three foot tall, basically goblin looking thing. And he got out of there on the other side of the fog, almost at the same time, his friend that he thought he saw in the fog, thought he saw Vincent in the fog, came in, saw the same thing from both different sides of the fog. <laughs> Just creepy stuff. Uh, I, I shared that experience on my channel. Uh, oh, yeah. But yeah, the fog, there's something about it. Uh, up here, the energy is so different. I try to explain to people the, the vast remoteness of Alaska has this energy of you, you're on your own. You know what I mean? Uh, like the places we go for the most part we bushwhack back there there's not there's not a groom trail you know what i mean it, it's all just the wilderness and so it, i don't know it's just something about the energy you can just pick up on it instantly when you're out there it it's just 
Wow. I, I can't even put it into words. You know what I mean? It, it's just massive. You know, the state yeah. is just so massive. You feel like a speck. <laughs> yeah, I've never been to Alaska. I got to come up and visit. I have some I have some friends that live not too far from me. Well, I say not too far, but it's probably like hundreds of miles. But for you, that's not that far. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, that's um, just that's in the neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> totally, totally. Okay, so there's actually another area that has fog. Uh, it's famous for its fog and something being in the fog. That's a Yellowstone National Park, Fred. Uh, I believe that's in Montana, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but they have uh, the Lake Yellowstone Whispers. And the fog that some say has Gugway hiding in it. And that's taking hikers and kidnapping hikers out there. Because uh, there's a lot of people that have gone missing out of that park. And they blame it on that fog and, right. and beings hiding in it. Right. And, well, um, and you can't ask you can't ask the missing people, what, was there fog when you went missing? Because, obviously, right. they're missing. You know what I mean? That mm -hmm. That's another thing that's frustrating up here is... You go to investigate a missing person. All you can, you run into a brick wall once you get that bulletin. All they release is a bulletin, what they were wearing, last seen, blah, blah, blah. And that's it. You can't get no backstory. You can't. It, and when you try to investigate it, they have their trump card, which is, oh, it's an open investigation. And then, you know, you, you can't get any information. So I when I first started my channel, I wanted to incorporate the missing, you know, not, not to say, oh, the hairy man stole them, but just as a PSA, you know, hey, this person's missing, that person's missing, but you can't, you can't get anything outside of a bulletin. And, and it's frustrating because, I mean, like Mary Wilson went missing last year, um, last seen July 12th, reported missing July 14th. They found her truck the same day on the Stampede Trail, which is north of me in Healy. Uh, about 6.9 miles or something like that. Her truck was there. They found her grandson in the back seat, two years old, uh, freaked out, a little dehydrated, but totally safe. Uh, and she was gone. Mary Wilson was gone. Uh, they found some personal effects a mile further up the trail. Now, <laughs> th that's not the way to safety. So wh what's boggling to me is this women, motherly instinct, Something drastic had to be happening for her to leave the child in the truck and not head the direction of safety to get help or whatever, whatever she was trying to do. And poof, gone, just gone. No, outside of some personal effects, there's, there's no other sign of her. And just, just the thought of that, I wonder what that little kid saw, you know, because oh. the kid's fine. The kid was just a little dehydrated, but the kid's safe. Kind of just, it kind of makes you wonder what compelling force caused that motherly woman grandchild with her that she loved to pieces to just leave her, leave the grandchild for whatever reason that, that to me is those kind of missing people stories that those are the ones that are compelling to me. And like the missing hunter from last August, those ones are compelling because of the high strangeness involved. The, uh, just certain things like, uh, okay, some people go missing after they've been at the bar, they get drunk and disappear in the woods. Okay, that happens. You know, some people want to go missing. Some people are murdered. So, you know, there's variables to it, but there's so many that are just these weird, just weird. You know, there was a 66-year-old runner who disappeared without a trace from the top of the summit on the mountain run. Um, I don't remember if that was Seward or Valdez, but gone, poof. And there's coordinators for the run everywhere. I mean, it's a, it's a marathon. It's a mountain marathon. There's all sorts of support staff through there. And this guy's just gone. They can't find a trace of him. Uh, wow. You know, there's uh, Valerie Sifsoff. She went missing down at Granite Creek about five years ago. Poof, gone. No sign of her ever, ever again, just gone. And, and, I mean, I can go on and on with the strange ones all day, but it, it's... It's disturbing for me that there's not a larger public outcry from the media or the powers that be um, just just to stay aware, be aware of what I mean, who knows. But that's, you know, that's another reason for my uh, my interactive map on the website is so people visiting or people who live here, they can check it out and see where an encur or an encounter happened and they can pull up. The, it's embedded with my YouTube, so it'll pull up the video. 
and they can hear about the experience someone had in that same area and maybe be aware of that 800 pound owl or that weird whistle or, or what have you, it, it, you know, it, it's, I don't know, to me, it, it's unacceptable for that many people to just go missing. You know, it, it's just, yeah. it's crazy. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. And that's part of my mission is to inform people of the dangers of being in these national forests down here. Um, and I don't want anybody to ever stop going to the national forest, but just be aware and keep your head on a swivel because there are so many people that go missing. I mean, you've, you've told many stories of people going and eating, picking berries and having Sasquatch encounters. Well, that's one of the, one of the yeah. things in, in the missing 411 series with David Politis is people go to pick berries and they're never seen again. Um, now I, yeah. I know that you, you probably have not ever encountered like a portal or anything like that, but some people think that there could be going through, walking through portals into like another dimension or something. I mean, it's, there's just so many people going missing it without a trace. It doesn't make sense. Right. And up here, I, you know, I, I, I never studied ley lines or anything like that, but we have a lot of copper and gold reserves up here, which are conductors of energy. And you know, there's tales of the Black Pyramid. There, there's all this stuff. There's a mountain where, you know, UFOs are seen coming and going from. I, I think there's far more going on than what we're being informed of. And, you know, mm -hmm. it'd be nice to have some of those missing puzzle pieces because some of this stuff is just so. Uh, I, don't, I don't I don't like things being deliberately covered up when it comes to anything public safety, you know, and obviously with that many people missing every year, that should be a public safety crisis. I mean, 500 to 2000 with our, we have less than them, barely over three quarters of a million population up here. It's like 780,000 and that's spread through the state. I mean, it, it's, it's absurd to me that it's allowed to not be, uh, you know, mainstream news bulletins every night, you know, Hey, you know, be aware of people who are going missing here, there, or everywhere. You know, you got the, the episode in Nome. Gosh, I forget how many years ago where they had that that UFO thing going on. Um, they made a movie about it like a decade ago, I think. The Fifth but, Kind. And, yeah, and, that's uh, a great movie. Yeah, problem is Nome doesn't have trees like that. So, <laughs> you know, they, they took liberty or whatever. That's, that's whatever. But, uh, yeah, just... Just all sorts of crap. I mean, through the whole state, no, nowhere is immune to to the crazy. You know. Well, it's at some point it makes you start wondering. The people that are not reporting this are they in on it? I mean, I know that I'm not accusing anybody, but I'm just saying uh, it makes you wonder: are they or why are they covering it up or just not reporting it? Well, I think, okay, I, I know some people on the inside when it comes to the Department of Public Safety. And so what I've heard is they can put down verbatim what's given to them in the reports, but it will be rejected uh, just off the top. And they have, the, you know, they're not forced, but they're, if, if this is going to be filed, it has to be changed. And I think it's, it's something ingrained in the system and it's not one individual going, Nope, we can't do that. Nope. We're not going to report that. I think it's, it's across the board ingrained where those who are in those positions to take the report already know, you know, through trial and error that reporting certain stuff, it won't go anywhere, you know? So they, you know, they chalk it up to bear predation or something, you know, they, they, they got easy outs up here because there's so many ways to die. You know? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I actually, so I had a, a state park ranger that contacted me down here in Georgia. Uh, he told me they were having eight or nine Bigfoot sightings in a month there. And he he was very, he was upset because he had had to take these reports from the people that were at his park and send it and, and actually write these reports out. Nobody else wanted to do it. <laughs> so he did it. Uh, he took the reports oh, wow. and had to send them to the governor's office, directly to the governor. But he, he got made fun of. It, by his higher ups and everybody, they they all made fun of him and really ridiculed him about all that, um, yeah. whether they believed in Bigfoot yeah. or not. Yeah, it's it's kind of sad. Uh, me personally, I don't give a flying rat's patootie what anyone thinks, uh, but it's just uh, 
I, I, from my vantage point, enough is enough. You know what I mean? Um, like, it, it, I, I encourage people to share their experience, you know, and for whatever reason, they like me sharing it. So I've kind of, I've kind of painted myself into this corner um, because of my lineage, the way we were raised, we were raised with the stories, you know, with the story night, you know, my grandma would tell us about berry picking areas and all this stuff. So my lineage is an oral history, right? So uh, because I have that lineage and, you know, people, like me sharing their stories i've kind of ruined any actual one-on-one -on -one interviews because a lot of times they're I'd be like well do you want to record we can do an interview oh no you, you do it better so it's like oh. you know I'm, you're I'm good kinda, at it though like, super good but, yeah <laughs> you know I, I don't know if people know or not but i i hate being on camera um i can't, can't stand it I, I mean i got 160 something videos so obviously i get past it but in my heart of hearts, it's like, ah, oh, this damn camera again. I don't want to deal with it. All right, all right, let me just do this. And that's strictly because I've been on the flip side of that coin where these things are coming in on you. And the hours of sheer terror we went through, uh, if I could prevent anyone from getting in a position to where they're dealing with something like that or, God forbid, worse, then, you know, I'm going to put myself out there for that. And again, I don't, I don't care what anyone thinks. It, it's irrelevant to me. Uh, until like someone has been in my shoes or anyone else's shoes, they got nothing to say to me, you know? Exactly. And I feel like this, I feel like this is your calling, Fred. And, uh, you know, I, I never saw myself getting in front of a camera and talking about Bigfoot either. Okay. So for whatever reason, God has put us in this right. position. Okay. <laughs> so here we are. Right. <laughs> uh, and, and Fred, okay, for, for my audience members that have not heard your that terrifying story with you and your cousin, your uncle, um, can you kind of touch on that a little bit to let my audience know like what that was about? Because that's a that's a fascinating story. Yeah. Um, so, well, in 2004, uh, my elder, he got the idea he wanted to do some gold panning. So it was a two year process of collecting all the portable sluicing gear and all that stuff so finally we weren't able to go in 05 uh because of a late fishing season so in 06 we uh we went up up to nushkak river because this is over in bristol bay so we went up to nushkak river to the nuyakuk river which is it would be the southern border of the proposed pebble mine area uh, rich gold uh, just gold all over and through there you know up to mulchatna river the whole area is just gold rich environment so he wanted to do some prospecting and potentially do a claim well <laughs> it's where we went was 248 river miles from dillingham and so once we were there darkness came down that first night and we were basically lured outside um uh, saw three sets of eye shine ducked back in the whole the whole thing went sideways when my cousin flopped under the table, uh, just scared to death, death grip on the barrel of the 30 odd six. And he's looking across the room. I make eye contact with this thing less than three feet away. Cause this shack's eight foot square. It, it's not big at all. I mean, the thing was just right over there. So make eye contact with it. it I knew instantly it was all bad uh, food. We were food. I, I never felt that before or since, but I instantly knew, in, you know, what was going on. It was just in the air. Uh, this thing started moving. And, I mean, this is microseconds that this is taking, but it's t far longer to explain it. It starts moving and I, I shot through the wall. Now, what was weird is once I shut that little J hook after we saw the eye shine outside, um, it was like earmuffs on. This pressure was constant. Like as soon as that door shut, it was like... We, we it was this we were under this pressure so when i shot through the wall with the 12 gauge thump 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 it, it was just a thump it, we should have just been uh, you know with three shotgun blasts but it just thump 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 uh it screamed and the whole place shifted and then it was terrifying stuff back and forth all night we finally were getting out of there and when i was helping my elder down we were on a six foot bank, six, seven foot bank, 20 foot from the front of this place. It felt like 10 miles that next morning because of all the hype, crazy shit going on. So 
once I helped my elder get his footing, I kind of I had to scoot back a little bit. I had his shotgun, which was this old, long behemoth goose gun, uh, on my back. So when I leaned forward, it kind of dug the stock in, so it kind of kept me pushing forward. So I had to scoot back a little bit. As I stood up, this rock, a little bigger than a basketball, boom, right past my face. And it impacted the water. Like, as soon as it was in front of my eyes, everything went slow motion. This thing went, it impacted about three feet of water and sounded like a shotgun blast itself. It hit so hard that uh, this fast-moving river, uh, it impacted before the water could uh, close up over it. it. It was just boom. It just immensely loud. And immediately I turn and I'm, I'm, I have the 30 out six at this time. And I put three shots on this, this big black one. This, the black one was like, like uh, black nothingness. Uh, it, it absorbed light. You know what I mean? It absorbed light. So I, I had no face to shoot for. I had no eyes to shoot for. So I just shot center mass. <laughs> it three shots with the 30 out six. This thing just stopped moving forward. It didn't flinch, didn't, didn't buckle, nothing. So, I mean, we ended up getting out of there, thankfully. But that's that other side of the coin, that where when it goes from scaring you away from their area to all of a sudden you're on the menu. When we got there, we did nothing. We, I mean, we weren't hooping and hollering. We weren't cutting down trees. We weren't doing anything but just existing in that shack. That That's all we were doing. And so... You know, we, we had uh, talked before about, you know, the connection between prospectors, gold mining and, and, and what have you. And that still intrigues me because what's the core? Is it because it conducts energy? Do they magnify energy with it? What, what's the you know, there, there's so many variables there. That's kind of like hmm, kind of makes you wonder what what's yeah. the correlation between the two. So, yeah, yeah creepy yeah. stuff. I, I it, it does make you wonder that. It, and it, I, I wonder if they're guarding the gold mines or something. I mean, and guarding them for what? Guarding yeah. them to protect them, maybe? I mean, because we get so many uh, historical stories of people that were prospecting for gold having Sasquatch encounters, and ca including Albert Osman up in Canada when he was kidnapped, allegedly, by a Sasquatch and taken oh, basically yeah. hostage yeah. for about a week. Yeah. Uh, hear a lot of stories about that it just kind of goes hand in hand even up to modern day yeah yeah and eventually i want to film my documentary it's going to be strictly through first nations eyes as far as uh, the oral history going back a millennia on up into modern times and how the two are still on the same level you, you know what i mean um i get little people stories all the time as well and wow. mm, excuse me I'm, I'm going to eventually get to all the Alaskan supposed folklore that is still continuing today. Um, there's Kushtaka down southeast, the little people, which are in a lot of places, uh, especially some of the remote islands. Some creepy reports from there, I tell you. Uh, I would much, I think I would much rather deal with the hairy man than the little people. Uh <laughs> Just because I, I got a I got a call a while back from a guy. Uh, he's he's in law enforcement. I've known him my whole life ever since we were little. Real straight laced guy. No BS. No drinking. No smoking. Just straight laced. You know, it, it, very uh, devout, devout Christian. Well, he's at his house uh, over in the Dillingham area, and he hears pounding on his wall and assumes it's one of his neighbors that likes to drink. So he starts yelling, hey, no booze here. Go home and sleep it off, buddy. Bang some more on a different wall. Three bangs each time. Boom, boom, boom. And then, you know, it worked its way around his house to where by the time it got to the front door side of his house, he had already was looking out the windows and had his shotgun to figure out who in the hell is banging on my house. He wasn't scared. He's the trooper. You know, he's a law enforcement. He's the guy, you know, so of course, so he hears it on the wall of the front door and he goes out and there's this three foot tall being, a uh, weird looking leather hat, flaps along the side, uh, like a greenish ash gray skin, uh, really weird. Like when you look at those old cartoons of a witch and it has a weird, you know, funky beak nose kind of thing, had one of those 
really long arms. He couldn't tell if it was fingernails or the fingers themselves were extra long. But uh, this thing was standing there and he was like, you need to get the hell out of here. I'm going to arrest you for trespassing. You know, and this thing just did nothing. So he lifted the shotgun up in the air. And when he did that, this thing immediately replicated itself. There was four other ones and there was they were just moving around. That freaked him the hell out. So he shot up in the air and poof, they all disappeared. They, they all disappeared. And then he heard the one walking on the gravel and saw the brush move as it moved away. Uh, he asked me, what the hell do I do? And I'm like, so I called around because I don't know what the hell to do. So I was told <laughs> that you leave some dry fish and some tobacco. And so he did. And he hasn't had a problem since. So I, I haven't had a chance to dig real deep because, uh, you know, when you reach out to people, sometimes it's hit, it's hit and miss. Uh, it's been really hard to talk to a lot of my elders about certain aspects of this because they're no longer with us. Mm -hmm. And so I've reached out to other tribes and other peoples uh, trying to encourage them to come forward because our oral history is being lost at a rapid rate. Um, we're losing elders just one after another after another. And I would like to get a a digital format of that oral history, you know, uh, you know, just, just for prosperity, you know, because it's getting lost very quickly, very quickly. Yeah. And yeah. to me, that's sad. To me, it's, it's the death of a culture, you know? Absolutely. Well, you're doing very important work. Okay. On so many different levels, Fred, because you're not only giving an outlet for people to um, tell their stories, but it's very healing. Okay. It's healing for a lot of people because a lot of people are uh, just listen to your stories. And they can totally relate. And, um, and the history is not going to be lost with people like you. Okay. Putting it out there and, uh, and helping people like that. I think it's, it's so important. Uh, and, uh, yeah, the little people stories, we've been getting a lot of little people stories down here in the, in the lower States too. Uh, I've, I've heard stories of little people. I actually have a, I've seen a video of one of my teammates, Dave Pardue has a video and it's got little people in it and it's thermal and you can see them and they're, they're, they're marching like in a straight line. We, we, we could figure they were probably aliens. Uh, but we can only see the heat signature on them. Uh, you couldn't really tell, but I don't, I don't know. I've seen aliens too, and they don't move like these little people did. Um, they just look like little people, you know, about two feet tall, maybe right. something the, like the that. Ones up here, right. These ones up here, roughly, you know, between two, three foot tall, uh, a lot of scare, uh, caribou hide for their, uh, their clothing. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, in certain places they're called sink sea, like your sink. And you see, but together, sink see, uh, which are uh, mm -hmm. reported to have long nails. They run real fast. They shape shift. Uh, all sorts of different things that involved with the little people up here. Uh, I don't know if it would be the same as a skinwalker. Uh, it just doesn't have the same same kind of vibe to it when you hear about it. But mm -hmm. definitely shape shifting, like Kushtaka, the Otter Man, or what have you. So I mean, there's a oh, few yeah. forms of the the shape shifting. Oh, yeah. Now, I, I got a report from a guy named Mark. Uh, he he saw a hairy man. Uh, he was on Oil Well Road uh, down the Kiski. And as he's watching this hairy man, it, right in the middle of the day, uh, because this thing started coming at him and covered, gosh, like 80 yards in just no time. And when it stopped, off in the distance behind him on the road, he heard, someone pulling a trailer and the chains jingling and all that kind of stuff. So this thing turned into basically what looked like a puddle in the snow and shape shifted into a moose in front of him. He said it was very similar to a moose when it was done, but the, the face was distorted. The face was off. And when he told me, I mean, that was the first I heard of a hairy man shape shifting. You know what I mean? So that was creepy. Uh, Cause this guy, he has nothing to gain. Yeah, he, he he's a straight shooter. You know what I mean? So just to hear that is, is kind of creepy. So now I kind of I'm looking at moose to make sure they don't have a funky face. Like, is that a, is that actually a moose? You know, just because you never know. I mean, there's so many unanswered questions and variables. You just never know.
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you mentioned those a little person or those little gnome guys having like a witch type nose. Now we actually um, have tales of the Cherokee witch here in the North Georgia mountains called a uh, spear finger. Okay. And we have potentially ran across something that was very similar or could have been spear finger uh, out in the woods. And I know that's a mythological creature to some folks, but it could also be very real. Do you guys have any kind of stories of witches up there, like old boo hags and things like that? No, um, no, not, not that I've ever heard, but see, you know, a lot of our tribes traditionally have been so spread out. Uh, um, that there, there could be, you know, tales of that from, from other villages and, and what have you, you know, not every village has a shaman. Um, and so, you know, there could, there could be something to that. Uh, I'd never, I never delved into that. My, my thing was I, I had experienced seeing and, and experiencing the hairy man. So I kind of went with that because I at least had something to talk about because the rest of it, I, I turned my back on my culture at a younger age because I, all that glitters is not gold. And I was, you know, the village life is boring. So, you know, oh, the city life, you know, the city. And I didn't know what I was turning my back on at the time. So there was a lot of things like I used to speak Yupik pretty fluently when I was a little kid, but I didn't retain it once we moved away. Uh, we would only come back during the summers for fishing, you know, for a number of years. And so, I lost a lot of that. I lost a lot of the, the oral history aspects of, you know, the things we were told, uh, the language and, and, and a whole lot of stuff. And so now that I'm older, trying to recapture that, it's very difficult because, again, a lot of the elders are gone. Um, and, you know, you can't you can't change the past. But, you know, if 2020 hindsight, I wish I would have paid more attention to what was being said because again it's an oral history you, you know no one's writing it down so yeah it's, it's unfortunate but i'm trying to retrieve what i can from cousins and you know the remaining aunts and uncles and you know just kind of make the best of what uh, what we got left so to speak Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I feel you on that. And I, I know I, I understood the importance as I got older of the stories of my grandfathers and my grandparents and my great grandparents. And uh, you know, even talking about my, my grandfather's fighting in world war II and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's just so important to um, and, and the civil war and all that stuff, you know, my, my, my father and I have people in my family that have really um, held on to the history of our families and uh, just spending time with them is so important. And I, and I want to teach my son that and uh and really immerse him in it because this all will disappear one day especially with history being rewritten by people in charge these days and stuff um you know th yeah. there's been so many cover-ups and uh we can only trust people that came before us from oral tradition like you have right. you know yeah yeah um, and that's the thing of about an oral history a lot of people say oh it's campfire stories well no it's life and death <laughs> and when like i talk to someone from the village and they're they're explaining something to me it is on a level of detail that you won't get lost you won't you know pick the wrong trail you won't go to the wrong berry patch it's very it's matter of fact there's no there's no joking when it comes to, let's say, uh, hey, you saw caribou, where at? They're going to say, oh, well, there, there's a line of brush, then there's this one yellow twig, and there's a small creek. They get down to the finest details so you can go exactly to where the caribou are, so to speak. So it, it's, it's actually kind of really cool. But another part of it, it's, it's hard to get people who haven't, live that to truly understand the the significance and the depth of it you know what i mean uh oh, yeah. yeah i just i don't know there there's certain aspects of what i'm doing that i have like i i have two web stores i i don't self promote for it it's i i i'm i suck at it I, i've had merchandise or whatever for over a year and i barely mention it I barely mentioned my, my website with interactive map. And for me, I, 
it's kind of hard because I feel like that self promotion, that the advertising for merchandise and all that, uh, part of me feels like it's taking away from like that lady I was talking about. Let's say for just as an example, she's seven eight. She's got issues. She she can't even be in her own home. Um, her husband's buried on the property. Like she has a lineage there and she's being robbed of that because of this crap going on at her property. And, you know, she's there alone. So she's, of course, not now she's with relatives up in Fairbanks, but just people are being tormented and whatnot. And I feel like a, a schmuck profiting from that, if that makes sense. Like, you, you, you know, shouldn't I mean? look like, at it oh, like hey, that, no. No, Fred, don't look at it like that because (laughs) the more that you put it out there and the more uh, advertising that you have, the more people you're going to reach. And that's important that, um, so just take a little time, balance out a little bit, do the self-promoting. And you know what? I'm going to be promoting this show. I'm going to be promoting your website. I'm going to be promoting your merch, whatever, Uh, you know, and and it's going on other people's shows like you're on my show today uh, and and, and getting the word out because you, you need to reach as many people as you can. Um, and so it, and right, it'll, right. it'll balance I don't, out. Don't I don't mind bad. reaching the people. Yeah, I don't. I don't mind reaching people and whatnot. It's just the whole, hey, buy my T-shirt. And by the way, this old lady's being tormented over here. Yeah, you, you know what I mean. I it, it's kind of yeah. I'm having a hard time kind of melding the two together. And it's just, it's my own thing. I'll, I'll, I'll get over it eventually. Because you're a human. That's why you're a human, and you're empathetic, and you have empathy, and you care about people. So. <laughs> You yeah. can't help that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, right. You definitely can't help that. Yeah. But you're doing great stuff. And I have one last question for today. Do you guys have dog man sightings up there? What's what's up with the dog men and werewolf sightings? Any any lately? I've, I've heard of no, I've heard of one uh in a, a little over a year. Just one, and it wasn't uh I, I can't honestly say what they described to me would be considered a dog man. Um, but, you know, I, I get sent photos. I get sent, you know, other people's experiences from out of state. Um, <clears throat> that photo I sent you, uh, that was sent to me a couple days ago. And uh, I had some guys, you know, image check it, you know, check it for, you know, the image itself is real. The backstory gets real murky real fast. Uh, the picture originated around 2012, um, South Texas, and that's where it starts getting real muddy. It, it was one story is there was three of them, and that one was shot rushing the people. The other story is there was 20 of them in a barn. They got this one. And there's a couple other stories. So it, it just gets so convoluted so quickly. Um, it, it's, you know, d- delving into pictures and video, once you start vetting them, it becomes it becomes real murky real fast. And so that's one of the reasons I don't. I have a bunch of photos. I have some video, uh, but it's so subjective to the person who recorded it that I have a hard time like showcasing it because of that. Like they had a hard enough time feeling ridiculed coming forward with the information or the photo That's right. to therefore subject them to further scrutiny because you know, the people out there are going to be like, Hey, wait a minute, that's another glob squatch or this or that or this or that. And it's like, you know, I, I warn them against it. And it's, it's not to be a gatekeeper or keep anything from anyone. It's, there's so much video footage out there. There's so many pictures out there. Uh, you know, if people can't accept what's already there now outside of that hoax bullshit, but yeah. there's legitimate, you know, uh, stuff out there. If they can't accept what's already there, there's nothing I could showcase here except maybe a dead body. And that would be, you know, the naysayers and the debunkers would be all over that as well. So, you know, it, it's just one of those things. And for the people that are trying to share the photos and, and videos and stuff, I I, I kind of warn them against it because mm-hmm. it took a lot for them just to reach out to me, let alone have it, you know, shared with the world or whatever. And then it just gets it gets hokey. 
Oh, I know exactly where you're coming from because I'm the same way. Like I, you guys don't see a whole lot of evidence coming out of my teams that we put out there publicly. Uh, even the portal video, we actually have a portal on video, like where people, we sent people into it and they disappeared and they came back out. So, I mean, and that's not been released to the public, but we'll, we'll show it at, at private like conferences or public conferences, but, um, but not just out there. It, we don't, we just don't put everything out there because even if people see it, they're going to try to, make fun of it and, you know, debunk it and all that stuff. And that's fine. They can, they can do that. Right. But it's just, you know, it's for our own team's research, basically. Right. Um, I, I share, I share stuff like that with people in, in the community, so to speak, to just to, you know, and I mean, I guess it could be viewed as a form of gatekeeping, but mm -hmm. there's, to me, the more, images put out there the more water the, the muddy the water gets because it's it's not looked at for what it is it's looked at for how did they hoax it how did yeah. they hoax it? so yeah. they're, they're, they're starting from a mindset off the top of oh well how am i going to disprove this instead of being whoa this was where this happened to who well, oh wow you know instead of looking at it objectively it's automatically scrutinized you know which is justifiably so you know there's a lot of people that want hard evidence and all that and in my opinion there's plenty of hard evidence out there oh there's so much there is now to, to backtrack just a little bit uh we're not we don't have the picture to show today but the the picture that you're referring to that you said that you uh showed me it's showing a uh, what could potentially be a, a small dog man and it looks like it has it looks like a dog, but it has like human hands on it and stuff. It's it's really it's really yeah. wild. Yeah, elongated back feet. Like that image is legit. The backstory it gets, you know, it, it gets whatever. Because in one in one posting it's a fraud, and the next posting, you know, the, you know, internet chatter, it, and that's where I was just like, I, I I can't do anything with that. You know, it just. I mean, the image is compelling as hell, you know, because I yes. had my tech guy do all the filters to it. Uh, I sent you to the three different copies, the original, mm -hmm. the reverse negative, and then the uh, the one that checked for Photoshop tampering. And, and the image is legit. There's no tampering of the image. So I can't speak to what he's holding, whether or not that's real, but the photo itself is real. So, you know, and that that's the best I can get. And I tried to get the backstory, but it just <laughs> took on a life of its own, just like most things on the internet, you know? Well, of course, of course. And I, I appreciate you sharing that with me. I actually uh, stopped my show. I was live on my show and I was like, oh wait, Fred's messaging me. <laughs> Hold on, I gotta see what he's talking right, about. Yeah. Here. <laughs> you, got, you were talking about the hyena and dog man and the tax. And I'm like, yeah, oh, check your phone, check your phone. I sent you some pics just cause, and, and that's and in did. Texas, you know? And the, the thing of it is, is if if that is a real creature and not just some stuffed animal they created or whatever, because you never know. Uh, the guy's look on his face is one of like, what the fuck is this? Oh, excuse my language, but what the hell yeah. is this? Uh, you know, if if it's the depending on what the true backstory is, it you know, these things are running around out there. You know, that's the creepiest part. Oh, they're more than just running around, Fred. I've I've had people on my shows that said there's a dog man breeding program going on in the United States. Right, right. So yeah. I what mean, does I, mama look like with, with having litters out there? Just ah, just uh, all sorts of variables that just creep factor, yeah. you know, it's just yeah, yeah, yeah. Creep, creep factor is on a hundred, actually, absolutely. And uh, and I know you're up there. Uh, you're the creep factor up in Alaska has got to be pretty high too. And uh, you're doing a great job, Fred, of getting yeah. stories out here and 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 doing your boots on the ground. You know, getting out there, experiencing orbs now. I'm so excited. Yeah, it, that it's made my crazy day. Stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there'll be more. Uh, more actual uh video footage of my excursions into the woods I, I haven't shown much on that you know um but i got i got footage i just haven't compiled it because i hate editing it's such a pain in the ass but uh I, i'll get some of those uh, deep woods adventures out on out in the footage and on the videos i just uh i hate the editing process because it's just a pain 
I, I can only imagine. That's why I do live shows, Fred, usually. Uh, so I just I just turn the button, hit the button, and then I hit another button, and I'm done. There's no editing. I know. I'm I I'm right. so low tech. It's ridiculous. I know. So, uh, yeah, you're you're way more advanced than I am, actually. If you're doing the editing and stuff like that, so. <laughs> Yeah, right. but thank you for everything you're doing, Fred, man. I love your channel. Can cool. you please tell my audience where to find your channel, uh, what it is, and your website? And um, so everybody can come find you if they're uh, yeah, not already following you. Uh, the website is subarcticalaskasasquatch.com, all one word. Uh, that has the interactive map. The interactive map is embedded with the YouTube channel of the same name. And... Uh, it's just, uh, I like the map because it's an interesting way of looking at an area that you may be visiting. And, oh, hey, there's a pin marker. You can pull up an encounter video from the area just so you have the heads up. But it's uh, Subarctic Alaska Sasquatch on YouTube. I put Alaskan with the N. Is it, it's not Alaskan. <laughs> it must have been a typo no, here. Sorry. No. Okay. So Alaska, y'all. Yeah, Take no. the N off. Okay. And, and yeah. also if, yeah. if people have an encounter, can they still email you at Alaskan Harry man project at Gmail? Yep. Okay. Yep. All right. That so y'all send your encounters in. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Awesome. Well, Fred, thank you so much for being here today. This has been amazing. It was so good to catch up with you and we actually didn't lose service today. And uh, I think, I think recording is the yeah. best option yeah. for us. Yeah. I love it. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. no, I appreciate you having me on. And uh, I'm, I'm running late now because I started the day running late, but I'm running late for some other errands and whatnot. But I'll okay. let you go. And thanks for having yes. me on, Jessica. I appreciate it. Thank you, it. Fred. And oh, my we'll gosh. I'll see you next time. Yep. Okay. All right. We'll talk you... again soon. Okay. Stay safe out there. Okay. Thanks, for Fred. Oh, yeah. 100%. All right, y'all. All right. Okay. Bye. Bye, Fred. Okay, everybody, that was amazing. I just love Fred to death, y'all. Uh, he's a very brave man. And y'all, please go check out his website, Alaska Hairy Man. Um, Alas no, Subarctic Alaska Sasquatch.com, y'all. I'm sorry. That was his email address. You guys, please uh, come see me. I'm going to have a remote viewing show tomorrow night, and then I'll be on Spaced Out Radio this weekend thank you so, to all my moderators this is a recorded show y'all so it was not live but i'm in the chat today <laughs> and hopefully fred is too okay or we have been and uh yeah thank y'all so much for everybody for being here uh i just appreciate all your support and all your love you guys stay safe out there and i'll see y'all next time bye <laughs> Baby.